Hi everyone, welcome to tonight's webinar, Loving Your Special Someone with a Psychological Disorder. My name is Zoe Kessler and I'll be your host this evening on behalf of PsychCentral.com. Before we introduce tonight's presenters, I'd like to remind you that you will be able to access the complete webinar online at Psych Central's YouTube channel later this week. If you haven't already checked it out, Psych Central has videos and webinars on a wide variety of mental health topics with guest speakers from many disciplines. During tonight's webinar, we'll, uh, we'll be allowing a question and answer period at the end, so feel free to type your questions into the question box on your control panel, and we'll do our best to answer everybody's questions, but we're also going to do our best to try and wrap up within an hour. So our presenters are going to present for about 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll have the Q&A. And um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, our two presenters this evening. I am very, very excited. I've done, as some of you know, a lot of these webinars, but I, I really do think tonight is very special. Um, we have Chad o. Stewart and Joan Winifred, and they have been married for 25 years. They're both bloggers for Psych Central. Uh, what does that mean? The couple that blogs together stays together? I don't know. Um, anyway, they're wonderful people. Um, they're going to try and help you to press forward on your own journey um, towards creating peace in your lives um, as you as you go forward with um, a partner who might be uh, experiencing some kind of mental health issue. Now, Chad Stewart as many of you know, is a cartoonist as well as a blogger for Psych Central. He's the creator of the cartoon series Mental Health Humor, an off-the-wall look into life from the mind of someone living with bipolar disorder. He's created something called the Family Stew series, and this chronicles Chato's life, uh, his relationship with his wife Joan and their four children, all while coping with the turbulent forces of mental illness and its impacts on family life. And Joan's blog at Psych Central is called Partners in Wellness, and I have to say, although I haven't really spoken with Joan many times, I can tell you that just even setting up for this webinar, I think you will find and agree with me, she is is such a compassionate and warm human being. I think the two of them together have so much wisdom and and good tips and advice to impart, so I should introduce them without further ado. Hello, are you guys there? Hello. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so, so much for doing this for us. I just can't wait to see your presentation, and I, I'm just going to switch the reins over now so that we can can start that presentation. All right, so over to you, Chato. And uh, yeah, so we'll just wait until Chato's got his PowerPoint. There we go, so I can see yours and we are good to go, guys. <laughs> Take it away. All right, well, um, thank you very much for that introduction, Zoe. and. Uh, well, John and I, uh, we'd like to say uh, you'd be crazy or insane to take marriage advice from us, wouldn't you say? That's for sure, honey. <laughs> <laughs> yep, uh, but we might uh, have a few tips uh, that might actually come in handy. Um, through our 25 years that we've been together. But before we go on, um, I'd like to mention that... Uh, we will be doing a little bit of a giveaway. Uh, anyone that uh, is watching and or watching now and have uh, participated with the webinar has a chance to win one of our caricatures. And maybe you might see someone up here you know, uh, or maybe you've been a mental health hero in the past. And so being uh, a mental health hero is something I've drawn in the past, and we can get into that at another time, a little bit later, but uh, you could win a fun caricature that uh, I've drawn, and I'll be um, getting into uh, my little 15 minutes of fame, uh, as 
Zoe went into a little bit. I have had uh, somewhat a little bit of success, but I don't want to get too big to my big ego. <laughs> yeah. You know, my wife can uh, go in a little bit about that a lot, can't you? Yes. We don't want you getting a bigger head. I mean, I do have to live with you so yeah. and the rest of the family, so we yeah. can move right along. Yeah, well, tonight we're going to be talking about our family stew, and this is based on characters and cartoons that surround the family, and that is my wife, Joan. Hi. Hi. <laughs> totally opposite of how she is in real life, thank you. <laughs> my son, who was born in 99, Sweet Pea, who was born in 19, uh, excuse me, 2001, I can't get that yeah. Uh, and Precious, born in 2003, and Belly, born in 2005. So we have four children, and they appear in our family stew. But moment by moment, day by day, 25 years, a partner. And, you know, what's interesting is tonight we'll be discussing, um, you know, what it's like dealing with that major depression with the suicidal tendencies, um, just swimming and surviving the emotional tsunami, the ups and downs for years, and how Chato has been able to find the funny in all of this and use his home humor to help us cope as a family, and also the importance of adopting um, a compassion culture and being able to freely forgive and have a positive attitude year-round. Oh, there we are now. <laughs> Joan, it's Zoe here. I'm just wondering if you could speak up a little bit, and maybe the mic has moved a bit, but um, I'm having a little trouble hearing you. Oh, Thanks. thank you, Zoe. You're welcome. Okay, thank you, Zoe. Yes, yeah, so it's interesting tonight that, you know, we'll be covering our story, the, hopefully the funny parts um, of how we juggle a family, uh, his, his diagnosis of bipolar, and um, I think it should all start at the beginning of uh, the next slide, honey, with his mountain adventure. Well, that's true, but first we have to get into my motto, Joan. My oh, motto yeah. has always that's been right. hope. Uh, humor gives hope, help. Excuse me, i got to get my motto right. Humor gives help, hope, and healing. And that was based uh, from the beginning of drawing the cartoons. But... We want to start by telling you about our story. And our story starts at the top of a mountain. And in fact, this is a real mountain, Mount Monadnock in New Hampshire. And with me, uh, the diagnosis of anything uh, with a mental illness, de depression or anything, um, the symptoms were there, but the diagnosis wasn't. I mean, there was hypomania, there was depression, there was self-injury, uh, suicidal behavior and ideation, but there was no diagnosis. But yet, it took me to get lost on a mountain before these triggers really um, came to fruition, I guess you could say. And now, this is a true story. I actually did get lost on a mountain uh, here in Mount Monadnock, and here's some proof of it. Uh, Hiker emerges after icy night in wilderness. But then I met Joan, and you know, using the, the smooth bipolar <laughs> pickup lines. Yes, odd humor really began our relationship. You know, we were at a gathering with some mutual friends, and I love to dance, and so that's such a great way to pick up a girl and felt her dancing and uh, tell her that she looks like a cow. So I felt like, hey, if you don't like my dance moves, stop staring at me and move on. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that really, um, personally, I, I believe when it comes to love and mania, I think they're one and the same. And for me, love is mania, and mania is love. And when you fall in love, you know, one of the things that Joan and I had together is this cosmic ability to bring anything on this cosmic level. And, and we felt like we go together like a peanut butter and jelly theory. It was back on um, July 5th, 1990. It was our real first connection or conversation on a deeper plane. 
where I felt like we, we connected on our essential values and our beliefs of living. And so it really gave me a glimpse into the inner person beyond the obnoxious humor. Sorry, honey. And um, yeah, well, the behavior. You know, <laughs> there was a lot of that. And so I really knew from that moment that, I, you know, I would marry this guy and we would make yummy sandwiches together. <laughs> and, you know, here's a side point that I'd like to bring up. You know, if you do find that special someone, that long-term partner, make sure your in-laws, one, like you or love you, or two, that you live far enough away that they don't impact your family dynamic, or you are at least uh, fortunate to have both scenarios. Me, I believe that your family or, well, I believe you shouldn't uh, have to ask for your hand in marriage, or at least asking for a hand in marriage shouldn't involve a shovel. <laughs> but this kind of led us to the next, uh, our next slide here. And this is what goes up, globophobia. Um, this is a, a true fear I have based on a, a phobia of balloons. It's a real strange fear of phobia. Um, yeah, something my fiance did not know about, and she loves balloons. And, um, and here is something I let her take it from here, John. Well, you know, it's just interesting because to me, balloons are so festive. And um, it was interesting that at this point in our relationship that this happy occasion really triggered some strong emotions with him. And so I really had no idea about the globophobia. And so now we like to think of balloons as really a fun reminder of not taking stuff too seriously and that if we lighten up a bit and laugh or else we may just pop. <laughs> Yeah. Later on, my children learn that they can also use my fear against me uh, to get dolls. Definitely. Oh. Well, the girls definitely have you wrapped around their fingers. <laughs> <laughs> depression right ahead. You know, the signs of depression uh, and the mania was like a roller coaster ride. My wife and I, uh, after we got married, we had a name for it. What was that name, Joan? The roller coaster ride of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. With the ups and the downs, the all arounds. You know, we learned that uh, in the first year of our marriage that there was something going on, but through holding on to our love, uh, the values, the strength, and commitment, our faith, and lots and lots of yelling. No, laughing, honey. <laughs> In the Lots face of, of fear. <laughs> Lots you know, of laughter. But with this undiagnosis, this undiagnosed bipolar, uh, it still doesn't mean you're not having symptoms, right? Mm -hmm. it, was, it was difficult at times. It was like, what is going on? <laughs> yeah, what's going on? Years of untreated depression was taking its toll on our family. You know, from the year we got married in 1991 to 1995, uh, when things were starting to go down to 2000, 2003, when I finally got that diagnosis, you know, years of untreated depression, you know, really took its toll on my hairline. <laughs> but as you can see, with the family, even though we were dealing with a lot, there were still times of joy in between it. But it's still, there were times that eventually brought to some real difficulty. And here's a, a page that Joan and I both get emotional at. This here was in 2004 when things really went downhill. But you know, we learned a lot from those, uh, from the happy times and the unhappy times. I mean, we really learned a lot of valuable lessons, such as uh, not being under, not over medicated. And so, really, what helped me find a measure of security was being in control of his um, compliance with his medication. I know some of us choose not to take meds, um, but some of us, like Chato, 
need meds to function. And so, you know, we feel that really a variety of positive things contribute to our wellness and recovery and not limited to any of these. Exercise, therapy, healthy habits, music, um, positive association, spirituality. And, you know, for me, I really had to learn to remain calm and emotionally neutral. So when his moods would swing uh, rapidly, I really had to learn to, um, you know, remain neutral and not um, get overly anxious or upset and not take things too seriously or personally and be easily offended. I mean, peace was really uh, what we valued. And so we really tried to pursue peace. And what helped us do that was um, Chato's toolbox of wellness. Yeah, having a toolbox of wellness is something that helped us. And one of the first things that we had in our toolbox uh, happened, fortunately, before that dark period came on, um, which we showed you the picture that, uh, it's, like we mentioned, was kind of a very emotional picture for us. But we had set up a safe... Um, what, a safety what? plan. A safety plan, yes. We had a safety plan set up because when we found out that I, when we, let me rephrase that, when I had a diagnosis, we educated ourselves and we set ourselves up with a safety plan that if things got bad to the point where there was a, a need for a safety plan, uh, that safety plan was put into action and Joan would initiate that plan. And you can. Yeah, and so it was initiated, and it really helped our family to get through a really rough patch, um, a really difficult episode of his bipolar. And so during that time, it, you know, all through these um, years and, and even now, it's really helped us to acquire a compassion skill set and realizing that it's the illness is the enemy and not each other or our marriage. And so we really had to learn to practice um, communication and relationship survival skills. Um, patience plays a big role in our family. Um, forgiveness and managing uh, strong emotions, you know, learning to freely forgive um, and not keep account or keep track of different injuries, but to try to move on the best that we could really helped our family. And also, um, we had to um, adopt compassion culture. And when I think of the word compassion, or courage, actually. Um, there may be a role model that may pop into your mind of someone that really epitomizes that positive trait. But one definition of courage that I like is spiritual, emotional, and moral fortitude to speak and act without fear in the face of obstacles and dangers. Because, you know, um, if we're not careful, all of us can really get a little self-absorbed and think primarily, you know, what's in it for me or what What's, uh, She's what talking I about me here <laughs> now. You've got to understand that. She's talking, the self-absorption, that's me she's talking about. Oh. Well, you know, we all have to be careful that um, we don't just think primarily of ourselves and not anyone else and what's good for everybody. Um, because really, compassion culture involves thinking of others and their well-being. And, you know, because everyone, all breathing fragile life on the planet deserves love, honor, respect, help, dignity. And so compassion really um, transcends everything in all borders. And um, everybody wins. So I love this proverb that says, there exists companions disposed to break one another to pieces, but there exists a friend sticking closer than a brother. So often I'll ask myself, you know, um, what kind of partner am I? What kind of friend? Am I compassionate? And one of the things we had to be is close friends, and that's one of the things that has helped us stick together is throughout it all, um, yes, we are man and wife, but we also are friends, and being friends has helped us, uh, especially in dealing with uh, my many mood swings. And, you know, um, I love that uh, cartoon channel that really expresses, you know, what the moods can be like. And so communication is really so important because our words harm or heal, hinder or help, 
you know, in harsh, cruel, abusive speech is poison to any relationship. So we try really hard. We try our best every day to be compassionate communicators, especially when we get moody or grumpy. Yeah, and it, it's taken me personally a lot to realize where that harsh, cruel, and abusive speech comes from and a lot of apologizing and a lot of begging and a lot of realization. Um, and, and my wife has been very forgiving and we have been working together on a lot and we're moving forward. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're we are. Forward. We are moving forward, like on to the next slide. Okay. Um, and, and so, you know, a lot with this compassion communication, because I'm a talker, is I really have to think, you know, is this a time to be silent? Is this a time to speak? Will these words be clear, crisp, convey what I truly mean, or is what am I about to say going to inflame or provoke pain? You know, will these words take away peace or add peace? And so another uh, wise proverb, by patience, a commander is won over, and a gentle tongue can break a bone. So when your partner is depressed or upset, you know, a gentle tongue, being gentle in your speech, can really help comfort and, and um, you know, improve the situation. Yeah. Can we go back to that peace part? <laughs> We could go on to this part about, yes. yes, constant vigilance and ongoing education necessary for suicide prevention. You know, at times it's really difficult when you have a bipolar partner who may be dealing with suicidal ideation. I mean, one second they may seem fine, the next second they're not, and so the flip can happen very fast. And so it's emotionally exhausting for them. And it's emotionally exhausting for the so-called healthy partner. And so, um, but together, you know, together, you know, you can endure. And it's really important to remember that all storms pass and that they're temporary and that, you know, we all play a role in the weather, the environment. You know, we can all be looking out for one another and help contribute to a, a peaceful climate if we know the warning signs of suicide, which are really important. Yeah, and these warning signs here, a lot of them you guys um, would be familiar with. Uh, but let me just tell you a quick uh, story when it comes to that. And it's really tough on a, number one, tough on a relationship if you deal with uh, suicidal behavior, suicidal ideation. Um, and that's something that I've dealt with uh, a long before I met Joan and into our marriage. And it's been very difficult throughout our marriage. but. It wasn't until uh, I was with my doctor one day and we were doing a, a simple, um, we were just going over a chart one day, he was asking me a couple questions and the end of the end of the conversation he says, okay, so you've had multiple suicide attempts and then he goes and proceeds to write that in my record, my permanent record. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, what do you mean? But through our discussion, that is true. I have had multiple suicide attempts. And that realization made me realize for the first time uh, throughout my diagnosis how serious, uh, serious things were. It kind of like knocked me out as this cartoon depicts. So sometimes Sometimes you get lost in in the idea of, um, or sometimes you get lost by the illness. The illness just sucks you in. Uh, and it's not that I wanted to die, not that I wanted to kill myself or take my soul, but the illness wants to win. And sometimes you just have to work hard to beat it back. And you have to win. And if you cannot, uh, you just can't let it win. So here are some of the signs of suicide. And, and also that suicide prevention lifeline is so important for people to talk and to, to remember that um, you were loved and you were cared for and, and we want you around. And so I think the next slide gets into that too as well about 
when we're um, freely forgiving and not keeping account of the injury. I mean, it's really hard at times for us to forgive ourselves, but um, forgiveness is really a value we cherish as a family. And, you know, we're not perfect partners. No matter how compatible or opposite or complementary we may be, you know, uh, we all say and do things that may hurt or annoy or worse. Not but, me. No, never, oh, never. No, not me. <laughs> you know, I don't do that. Life is stressful. Marriage is stressful. You know, being parents is stressful. But we always try to remember that our worst day is only 24 hours. I mean, if we can get through 24 hours or moment by moment, you know, each morning is a fresh start. So whatever the situation, it may sting, but... Be forgiving, you know, when we freely forgive and we, you know, it's not that we're really minimizing the offense, nor are we inviting further mistreatment. We're really letting go and we're renewing yeah. our emotional well-being. And so we're choosing to really be better and not be bitter. And so, you know, we're choosing peace. So we try to remember that when we forgive, we're choosing peace. Yeah, yeah, it may sting sometimes and a few times you might have to bring an EpiPen with you. <laughs> Maybe two. But. but you know what helps with that, honey, is your ability to harness humor to heal. And so when you can find the funny, even in a real serious uh, situation, a somber thing, it really elevates things. You know, humor can be such a breath of fresh air in a real stuffy room. And so, you know, what I like about um, the mental health humor cartoons is that it really takes sort of taboo topics that people are you know, not too comfortable always discussing, but it really does help destigmatize uh, certain topics and, and helps to really address them and bring them out in the op open um, through these silly concepts. And so I think humor can really bring a lot of comfort and it can really help you to focus on the positives in life and see the big picture. And so, um, I think true humor is really refreshing. Not sarcasm that, you know, there's, there's sort of a trap with sarcasm that it can really hurt and humiliate, but we don't try to go there with our humor. We try to keep it as uplifting as possible. That has helped us. Yeah, we want to try to make sure that we use positive humor um, and try to focus on bringing and building people up. And that's one thing about the mental health humor cartoons, the other cartoon series that I have, is, which is the Family Stew, also the over-medicated. Uh, it's all part of a way to try to build people up and also explore the life from my point of view as someone living with a disorder or just from how it may feel, like for instance, mania gives you wings. <laughs> yes, and, and you know, um, when we learn to practice positives and, and, and habits that contribute to our wellness, uh, what do we find? Something positive. I, I love these proverbs again that says, uh, whoever acquires good sense loves himself, and whoever treasures discernment will find success. It, you know, the naive person believes every word, but a shrewd one ponders each step. So it's so important to continue with that education about the illness and find ways of, of coping that are positive so that you can deal with, you know, the disappointment, the anger, and the rage that is going to happen. Dealing with the dar. <laughs> the dar. The dar. The disappointment, the anger, the rage. But you know what leads to that is really having unreasonable expectations. You know, if you have like unreasonable expectations about things, we're all going to get disappointed. But, you know, if we can practice um, certain things that are positive, you know, gain some wisdom, we can really build up our house and we can work on solutions together. And, you know, when we hop on things or we're nagging, you know, it really separates close friends, but when we can learn to cooperate and forgive and um, have that love and respect is so important, um, you know, it goes a long yeah. way of keeping people together. Yeah, family is important and, you know, letting them down was and continues to be my dar. 
<laughs> as a guy, depression was always presented differently and in the form of dar, disappointment, anger, and rage, which goes in nicely with, uh, wow, what a seamless entrance. Segway, yes. Segway. Segway. And to, you know, being aware of the differences between, you know, uh, male and female depression or the way it presents differently in, in people so that we can be aware of what's going on. And there is such a thing as invisible anger. You can be mad and not even know it. Dar! Or you can have, a, you know, someone on your Facebook page or someone else that you just really want to have some <laughs> negative feedback with or like to go, Dar! Say hello. My wife loves this cartoon. Now, I thought it was because of my spelling, but I'll let her tell you what she likes. <laughs> you, know, I, you know, I enjoy a lot of his cartoons, but I think this one is so poignant because we may not realize when someone's angry that there's such a link and a connection with anxiety. You know, they may be feeling very anxious. They may be fearful, and so it's masking as anger. Um, and so it's it's important to be aware of that so that we can you know manage that strong emotion of anger to learn to manage and cope with anxieties of life and you know what really helps us with anxieties too is um, attitude you know attitude is is a lot of uh, yeah. everything really right it, <laughs> it, it is. It is. Let me just say one thing. Uh, when it comes to depression with, with guys, um, for years I did not get help because I thought I was weak. Uh, being weak is not a, is not a reason. Uh, don't let that, don't let the stigma of that not let you get help. You're not weak if you get help for depression. Um, in fact, it takes courage and strength to get help. Um, so anyone, any man out there, don't think of it as being a weakness, it's a strength. So if you think that you need help or if you feel depressed, go get some help. Take a, uh, in fact, on Psych Central there are some uh, tests, uh, some it, you can take that will help you determine if uh, you need to take the next step. But let me go to the next slide on gratitude. Yeah, gratitude, year-round attitude. And, you know, I am very thankful that Chato feels that way, that he was humble and modest enough to realize that he needed help and to seek it out and to comply with doctor's orders and, you know, our efforts to help. It only took how many years? Well, you know, it doesn't, it's a process. We're all a work in progress. And so we'd like to count our daily blessings, you know, be content and thankful for whatever we happen to have. You know, when you can, you know, I like this point here um, from the book, Fighting for Your Marriage. When you choose or actually when you focus on what you didn't get, it's too easy to forget all that you did get. So um, what helps me too is, is journaling. Like I like to write, it helps me to cope. It's an activity that helps me to, to try to be thankful for what I have. Yeah, Joan really, uh, she's the writer of the family, so to speak. Uh, in fact, she inspired me so much to do the writing. And I, I dealt with dyslexia. I'm dyslectic. have had that diagnosis well before when I was eight years old. It was diagnosed. I have a very difficult time when it comes to uh, reading and writing. So she's my editor, um, or I, what I like to call it, she's my well, she likes to <laughs> translate. She needs, you know, she uses a cryptic pen to dig, to, un, uh, to basically, what do you... It, translate. Translate. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> to translate anything and everything that I write. Spell check does not work for me. Uh, Joan does. No. Joan does. <laughs> yes, she does. No, no. Honey, it is my privilege to to do whatever I can, you know, we're partners, we help but each other out. But she has inspired me to, to do the writing that I that I do, and hopefully it's good writing, um, but, but I'll let you great, decide. It's a great tool, uh, writing really can help it you does. express emotions in a, in, a, 
in a way, in a healthy way, to manage them, especially, you know, the many moods that can come up um, with a psychological disorder. Yeah, well, with the many moods that come up uh, when you're loving a partner with a psychological disorder, you have so many challenges. And, you know, it's not just the negative moods. You have to deal with the extreme positive moods, especially if uh, you're dealing with someone with bipolar disorder. That those positive moods can be very taxing on a relationship as well. And here uh, are some of the symptoms of bipolar disorder. Uh, you can see me in all my glory of my symptoms. And being someone that uh, can rapid cycle, that could be a picture of me within, what would you say, 20 minutes, an hour? <laughs> just a, you know, just a few hours, not even, you know, at one point he was uh, rapid cycling, so, you know, you could blink and there could be a mood change, you know, but it, it's it's quite an education in compassion, compassion and empathy building, um, you know, and, and I, I really have gotten to know Chato in every shade of, of the mood spectrum. Um, and so he really has been learning to tame the moods, and we've been learning to really uh, be able to respect each other. You know, the person is essential. I mean, you know, you need to really also respect bipolar, acknowledge that, yes, it can be life-threatening, it can be a life-threatening monster, but then at times, you know, it can be a quiet little mouse. I mean, you really have to respect each mood. And Yeah, um, John had to learn the difference between the, who the inner me or it is or was and the symptoms of my bipolar. Uh, she also had to continue um, to figure out the difference between each. Right, and you know, it, um, being able to do that, you know, knowing him well enough and uh, being able to see sort of a, a consistent pattern over time sort of builds trust and so um, I was able to, well, I'm still learning, we learn every day, but I was able to, you know, differentiate the true shadow, <laughs> the real person from, hey, these lousy symptoms. You know, he's sick, he's not feeling well, and so it really helped me to continue to respect the relationship, to value the relationship, and to respect my husband during difficult times, and so together, yeah. you know, we were able to really learn how to tame the beast. The wild beast. <laughs> That's bipolar disorder. Um, and other things, of course, that come with that. You know, learning to be flexible and reasonable definitely helps. Music is something my wife loves uh, and has helped her in coping. And, and you got to understand, she is not only a, the mother of my four children, our four children, but she's also a caregiver, and she has been the caregiver since my diagnosis in 2003. But also before that, she was also taking care of what we didn't know, uh, the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and she took care of uh, those points. And I, we didn't really get much into it, but I was dealing with, um, to deal with my emotions then, I was dealing a lot with cutting and burning and branding. So she had to deal with some... Um, really bizarre things that that she never understood and we didn't understand because there was no stuff, there was no internet then. But you know, um, like anything, over time and patience and, and love and respect and forgiveness, um, you know, we, we learned different things and, and we learned what really helped us. And of course, you know, the moods change. <laughs> Um, he would have better times, and so music has really been a gift to our family. It, you know, upbeat, soothing songs to lift our spirits, and also, Chato is a good cook. I'm glad about that. He loves to cook every day with oh, the kids. Oh, I love to and, and also, with the kids, right. right, and also spending time in nature is good to manage stress. And Fishing. Talking, right, and talking with, uh, you know, trusted friends. Having an outside support system, and you know, volunteering in our community, and and just having other um, interests as a family, so that we're not consumed by bipolar, um, helps us to continue pressing forward positively. 
And One of the things we learned, yes, is you must have sleep. Yeah. One thing, you know, earplugs and being in melodious songs <laughs> of my children. <laughs> There's yes, my indeed. daughter with her beautiful yellow dress and her favorite lizard, Bob. <laughs> but you know that can be a challenge, you know, with a with a lot of kids and and then the illness and so um, you know being able to get a good night's sleep really does make quite the difference for us. Now again, getting back to something serious, the taming, the cutting, and the branding, and the self-injury. And one of the things that uh, really helped me was the art therapy. And didn't really get into this, but when uh, in 2008 when I entered into the CSU, um, I told you how I like to journal, but I didn't tell you how I journaled. Joan did uh, really give me the love of writing. But when I entered into the CSU, instead of writing, I started to draw. And by the time I came out of the CSU, the mental health humor cartoons were born. And in the CSU, I would draw cartoons and I would give them to the children in the kids' ward to color. And when I came out, I continued to draw. And drawing these silly cartoons about very serious subjects became such a positive coping skill that I didn't realize uh, that it had such a positive effect on, on me that I actually stopped doing what uh, this non-suicidal self-injury. I stopped branding, I stopped cutting, and I was replaced with, with art therapy. And so um, I'm so happy that he was able to adopt this um, positive coping skill, a healthy coping skill, even though I don't believe at first when he started drawing that um, he realized that that would be the thing to help him with the self-injury. And um, so I'm very, very proud of the progress that he's made. and. Um, I'm really happy that we have these humorous cartoons um, in our life. Last family fun tips. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and drawing again drawing the cartoons led to more family drawing. And when you're a cartoonist. Uh, at home, you're a cartoonist family, and so we did a lot of family drawings. And here is a beautiful picture of our host Zoe, drawn by Belly at the age of seven. And you can see she did a beautiful job. Yes. Yeah, I think it looks just like her. Don't you, John? <laughs> looks just Very like close. Zoe. Very close. Well, you know, each of our kids have really um, grown creatively and. Um, it's really helped them to learn to manage their emotions in a, in a positive manner. And so we do spend a lot of time together as a family with positive activities. The kids have even helped me draw some of the mental health humor cartoons. And we've even posted them on Psych Central. Here's one Belly did with me. She drew it along with me. And of course you have us as a family. Number one dad. You know, when I have that mug, I have that tie, I even have the t-shirt to prove it. <laughs> and he has plenty of hugs from his kids too, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, that kind of does it for our special here, and we want to thank Zoe and our host, Psych Central, John, and I uh, want to remind everybody about the caricature that I will try to draw of one person that uh, will send us, I think, uh, I think Zoe will get into it. Will Zoe, Zoe yeah, can get into that? I certainly will. Wow, that was a lot of stuff, guys. That was really 
really amazing and I I do want to thank you um, I'll thank you at the end but just just off the top thank you so much for being so open and honest with your sharing and there was just so much there I'm I'm glad we can review this and watch it again we do have some questions from some of our attendees you can hear me yes yes yeah good okay so yeah I do want to get I see that we've only got about 10 minutes left but we do have some questions um, one of the folks who's with us um, has asked um, yeah just about a timeline a bit Chato were you diagnosed before or after all your children were born how did that and I guess I'd like to add how did that impact um, your dealing with uh, bipolar, having kids versus not having kids? Right. Well, before we had kids, uh, we had a name for it. As uh, I went over, we called it Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Uh, we had uh, our first child in 1999, LP, um, and I wasn't diagnosed until 2009, uh, excuse me, 2003. <laughs> um, so we had another child before that. So we had two children before the diagnosis and two children after. Um, it really affected the diagnosis or in such a way um, there was a, a big impact um, for me personally uh, and just the stress level I think both on kind of more triggers and a little more financial stress really added to that. But Joan can, could probably tell you because, you know, it's, it's kind of hard when you ask me because I have kind of like these, you know, uh, kaleidoscope glasses and I remember yeah. things like, oh, everything was hunky-dory because, <laughs> you know, I've seen it in a different way. Yeah. But Joan could probably tell you how it really was. Well, you know, thankfully, um, Zoe, you know, the really bad episodes or, or when um, – you know, he went through some difficult times. Uh, can you speak up a little bit? Um, oh, Joan, when he went through some, there we go. Okay, when he went through some difficult times, um, thankfully, some of the episodes, he would get really bad in the evening. Hmm. And usually the kids were at, asleep then, so I was so thankful for the timing of events. Hmm. And so at, at some point when he was really sick um, with the bipolar and, and the suicide ideation, the children were, you know, sort of sheltered and um, cushioned a bit uh, because of their ages and um, just because of the timing of events. Um, and, and so, you know, we have heard from their doctors and from uh, trusted uh, people who are educated in the mental health field that, you know, they're adjusting well and that, um, you know, they're pretty healthy kids, so we're, we're very thankful for that. You know, we've sort of had a lot of um, things in place to help them with their um, health, mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual health. Right. And so we really do try to work together as a family to, you know, be as healthy as possible. Mm -hmm. And and do you think that, um, Chato having been diagnosed, do you think that, that helped the children who were born before the diagnosis? I mean, do you talk to your kids about what's going on now that you know better yourselves, or what does that sort of look like? Well, we do talk to the children. The children do know uh, that what I'm dealing with, and they are informed on an age-appropriate level, mm. uh, and they've always been informed uh, as to, uh, you know, what I – what I deal with. In fact, one of my children, when they seen the Wellbutrin medication, once called it my happy pill because oh. the way Wellbutrin was. Yeah. Well, it, it and they looked at the medication and the way it was spelled on the medication, it actually looked like a happy face. So <laughs> that was what they visualized, and so they called it my happy pill, not knowing that that's what it actually was. <laughs> Right, right. Okay. I guess I should move on. Thank you for that. Um, we do have another question, actually. Um, okay. Someone has asked, do you worry that your children may have mental health problems? Well, you know, 
parents worry about everything with their children. I mean, you love them, you want the best for them. Are we overwhelmed by that uh, worry? No, because, you know, worrying is like sitting in a rocking chair, rocking all day, hoping to get across the, the room. You're never going to get anywhere. And so, you know, we try to keep positive and focused but aware you know it's that balance you don't want to be consumed by worry or consumed by a diagnosis um, mm -hmm. you want to be realistic and not have um, unrealistic expectations for your family members but we want to all work together to reach our potential mm -hmm. um, and so we do a lot of things together as a family we're open and honest with them they're educated about the illness and it's like anything we're just hoping you know, they'll continue to progress and be happy, you know, responsible adults that contribute mm -hmm. to the peace of the planet, you know. Right, right. And and if I may, I, I just want to jump in and sort of maybe it occurs to me, though, now as well, that now that you have a diagnosis and you've worked out, I think you mentioned a safety plan and you've got treatment and supports and all of that is in place. So would you say that, would you agree with my thinking that, you know, now that you have walked yourselves through that kind of education and experience, you can also address the stuff that comes up in the children because you know so much more uh, and you have so many more skills in dealing with it. Would you say that, that that's uh, accurate? Both well, we're, we're not professionals by no means, but we do have um, a lot of experience by dealing with our my illness and her dealing with someone as a caregiver. So in that aspect, as parents, uh, we definitely are aware of um, some of the signs and or things that could be, uh, things that could definitely be a trigger uh, mm -hmm. in that aspect. So we are aware of things that we should be looking for. Um, number two, we are definitely, these children are well, a little more um, insightful to the mental health world than most because they've been around it. They come with me to uh, seminars, they come with me to conventions, um, <laughs> you know, so they are, and they help me with a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff that I do, so yeah. they are, a little more educated than uh, than a lot of um, people, a lot of children their own age. So, right. and we do a, a lot more education when it comes to um, you know these types of when it, when it comes to this type of. Um, Topic. Yeah, topic. I right, and say. and if if you don't mind, I'd like to jump in and say, yeah, of course, you've you've mentioned several times how, I I guess yeah, duh, it just hit me. Your children have helped you with the cartoons, so what a fun way to also get an education about it. I mean, they've been right in there, um, learning that way as well. Chato, I I actually I see the time is flying by here, and there's so much I want to ask, Joan. I I was wondering, um, to go back a little earlier in the presentation. I mean, and I have to say, I'm being a little selfish about this. I have ADHD, as most people know here, and and with that, a lot of adults with ADHD experience, you know, irritability, and we have anger issues often as well. And I think about a partner in that situation. Um, so, Joan, you said something about you, you know, that you you re, you remain emotionally neutral, and so I'm wondering if in these times of you know difficulty. Can you give us any tips on how exactly or how you can do that to remain emotionally neutral when you're right in the thick of it? What what would you like? Do you deep breathe or what do you do? <laughs> well, you know, depending on Fire the situation. Fire flames out of your nose. <laughs> <laughs> you know, depending on the situation. Yeah. I, I, I do a variety of things. Um, you know, prayer helps. Um, mm. You know, I, I try to not prejudge a situation, not make any assumptions, don't let um, others' infectious moods um, really change how I feel in that moment mm. in time, mm. not let their anxiety sort of rub off on me. If someone is really upset, I feel like, you know, the logical thing would be not to throw more wood on the fire, but to sort of <laughs> diffuse the situation and, um, you know, an answer when mild 
really does turn away rage and helping to really assess the situation, you know, really gaining accurate information and evidence to see whether or not this so-called negative is really a negative or maybe this right. negative is really a positive and so not jumping to any conclusions without all of the facts, you know, mm -hmm. and so trying to really assess things and, um, you know, not letting the mood swings sort of, you know, swing me like a pendulum back and forth. Yeah, uh, she's pretty stable with that. That That's one mm -hmm. thing I do. I do a lot of jumping, jumping to conclusions. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And then you find, you realize that, okay, well, it's uh, the wrong conclusion. Right. Jo Joan, does that get easier over time? Have you found, like, practicing, keeping that? Ignore are you asking if well, she's well, still practicing I, ignoring I me? I think, I think it's a, no. a, a matter of a few different things. Um, uh, Zoe, it's sort of hard to superficially answer this um, in just a few seconds, but um, I, I think some of it is, is really learning my own personal self-control mm, um, to be right. able to, you know, not let something um, really provoke me and mm. valuing, you know, the peace and the relationship and also, like, just sort of trying to cultivate humility, too, like, not taking this so personally, like, mm. this is an affront or an attack on me as a person. You know, right. this is the illness talking or the situation or maybe there is some anxiety or fear or something beyond the person's control. And so really just trying to gather all the, the evidence, you know, clear cut, cut, um, cut mounting evidence as to what is really going on or really what is the situation before you speak. You know, so I think really listening too can help. I'm always working on that, you know, trying to listen, be a listening ear, you know, acknowledging the person's feelings, you know, that they are upset and what you can do to comfort or help them. I think really helps to add to the piece and not take it away. Right, right. Um, um, we've only got a couple minutes here. Thank you, Joan, for that. And I, I really especially appreciate the reminder, and it's so true, that ultimately the only person we can or have control over is ourselves. And I love that reminder, you know, is just sort of taking ownership of our own feelings and responses and reactions. So thank you so much for that. Now, I realize that oftentimes we do have people listening in uh, from all over the world, actually. And for us Canadians, I want to mention a CSU. That's not something we have in Canada. Um, quickly, what does that stand for, Chato? Crisis. Crisis Intervention Unit or Crisis Stabilization, Stabilization Unit. Oh, okay, thank you very much. So we've got our Emerge. Okay, great. I wanted to say that. And also for folks around the world, I know that in Canada we do have a line for a crisis, a crisis line, suicide prevention line. I'm sorry, I don't have that number at my fingertips, but um, I'm pretty sure most you know people listening here, their country will have that line um, as well. So gee whiz, we are closing in on the end of our presentation here. Um, Chato, I'm just going to switch over for everybody so that we can see my screen and um, start to wrap up. Um, yeah, and talk about our contest. And I just feel like we've covered so much, but there's so much more, you know, that we'd like to hear from you too. I hope, you know, maybe you can do it again sometime. <laughs> I don't know. If I talk, Sounds if I like sweet fun. talk, you do it. <laughs> It sounds like fun. Oh, it's been wonderful, and I really enjoyed it. Especially, it's, I have to say this. It's been the most colorful presentation we've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you too. You guys are great. Um, all right, so everybody, we've got to wrap up, um, but I do want to remind you of uh, Chato's generous, generous offer. They've both been so generous with their time, and Chato's extending that to this bonus gift. So Chato and Joan would like to thank you for attending their webinar, as they did, and one of you uh, will receive a free original caricature of yourself, drawn by Chato Stewart. And um, now this is uh, a second take for our webinar replay, so we have a new deadline. Um, here, here are the instructions. So go to psychcentral.com's YouTube channel. If you're looking at this, you at the replay, you're, you're already there. And watch the whole video replay, and while you're doing so, note the time on the video where Margarita Tartakovsky's character appears. Now, Margarita is a, a Psych Central associate editor, has her own blog, blog called Weightless, 
Now, when Margarita's caricature appears, note the time, and then on March 14th, send the time that you see Margarita's caricature to Chato at the um, email address you see here, and the first email that he receives with the correct time will win. So please remember to attach your uh, photo, and um, I guess your yeah, yeah, your photo, and he'll have your email, and he'll e email that out to you. So I am very sorry to say we have come to the end of our webinar this evening. Um, it's just been quite an eye-opener, and uh, wow. <laughs> um, so I would like to thank everyone uh, that joined us at their live session. And also, uh, I would like to thank Psych Central for hosting, and of course, I saved the best for last. I would love to thank both of our special guest presenters, um, Chato Stewart and his lovely, compassionate wife, Joan Winifred. Both of them have blogs at Psych Central. You're welcome, and please, please, I encourage you to go to psychcentral.com and check out both of their blogs because you'll just get more good stuff and more tips. So thank you from the bottom of my heart, both of you, and uh, I do hope that we'll have you back at some point in the future. So on behalf of me, Zoe Kessler, your host, and, and Joan and Chato, good night. Good night. Good night.